program at DOC. Um, I sit in what we're calling the technical development team. So it's inside the science group um, and our main focus is all around sort of R&D and the new stuff. Um, how I got into this is I've been doing conservation pretty much since the day I was born. Um, I've been involved in a number of island eradications around the world. I sit on the department's island eradication advisory group which provides advice both in ter uh, to DOC the New Zealand projects um, but also internationally to various projects around the world. So I've got a wee bit of an idea about eradicating stuff um, and then I've been working for DOC for the last seven years um, for the first five of which I was our main biosecurity contact dealing with new to New Zealand organisms with um, the likes of MPI and the EPA. Um, and I've been part of this since about December 2012, so we're a fairly new program um, and we're just kind of getting going. I'll just clarify as well, when I say predator, I mean in possum, uh, stoat and rat, and sometimes I also mean feral cat, um, but I can clear that up as we go along. So where did our program sort of come from. So in December of 2012, um, there was a pest summit held in Wellington over two days with about 50 odd scientists, philanthropists, pest management experts, kind of a whole sort of range of people, all sort of with different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. And they were basically brought together for two days to think about if New Zealand in 20. 50 was predator free, so rat, possum, stoat free. What have we done to get there? Um, basically, they came up with these seven directions for action um, that came out of it to sort of spur some action. And our program sits fairly and squarely there. Um, we also get into these two areas and in time, we're hoping to also <coughs> jump in on a bit of that as well. Um, so when we got thinking about you know, pest management at really large scales, we started wondering, is it just a case of taking what we've done really well on islands, um, you know, the Rangitoto, Motatapu, multi-species eradication, and going, right, let's just pick that up and plonk it pretty much anywhere we like um, and see how that goes. And pretty quickly in the thinking of that, we realised that's not going to work. Um, there's a whole heap of reasons why. Some of them are just the sheer basics of, um, you know, we can't even produce that much bait that we need for those size landscapes in the time frame that you can have it on the shelf. Um, others are that we start working in places where people live, so we can't just do whatever we like. So we started thinking, well, what is it that the Future of Predator Control Program should be doing and should be looking at? And we pretty much came up with this. So there's a couple of things I just want to clear up here. Um, the main one being elimination. So what my program's all about is taking sites to zero. So we're not talking about sustained control, we're talking about taking predators to absolute zero in these sites and then holding them at zero. Um, I use the word elimination rather than eradication because there are some people who are far more knowledgeable in eradication than I am who believe that eradication should have the distinction of it's done in places where it's very unlikely stuff gets back to it and everything else should be called elimination because you should expect stuff to get back, it will get back and you need that as part of your plan and part of your thinking. So we're working on the mainland so we know stuff's going to get back um, and that's just all part of it. So what does this look like? Um, for us it's a brand new approach. It's something that we term remove and defend. So basically removing all the predators and then defending against reinvasion. Um, you may think, you know, why do we need a new approach on the mainland? Our predator control stuff works just fine. Um, well, it's our opinion that, yep, yeah, you're right, it does work good. It's just there are limitations on it. The tools we use at the moment are incredibly labour intensive, they're expensive, <coughs> and that limits how big you can go or how many people you need to be a part of it. 
It relies on ongoing treatment. We're constantly going back and doing the same thing at these sites over and over. It's our view that predator control on the mainland has an ecological cap on it. We don't get these places as pristine as we do with our offshore island eradications yet. And then the biggest one probably is the fact that there's communities involved and some of them like our tools and some of them don't. <coughs> so we're hoping with Remove and Defend we can take out some of these limitations. So, where do we begin? New Zealand's quite a big place um, and some of these challenges are massive. So, it's our view that to innovate you need constraint. You need specific questions that you're looking to solve Otherwise, you just kind of make new stuff that may or may not be applicable. So for us, we've been focusing on where are these really big sites we want to go after, and also been thinking in a sort of 5, 10, 15 year time frame. So what I'm about to show you doesn't mean we're going to go at these places. It also doesn't mean we're going to go at these places tomorrow. But it's all about thinking, if we are going to go there in the 5 to 10 year time frame, what is it about that place that we need? So we wanted to give ourselves some, some constraints, some rules about how to, how to pick. So we firstly we thought, well, let's just take New Zealand and go, well, OK, hang on. Obviously, you're not probably going to stick somewhere in the middle, because that's not going to make it very defendable. Um, we also wanted to put a limit on our size. So, we talk large scale, we're talking anywhere between 20 and 200,000 hectares. Yeah, defendable, so that's why these circles anyway are, are peninsulas or they are big islands. Um, it's just a lot easier to defend on one front rather than somewhere in the middle. Uh, we have had a look at the dock um, prioritisation system to get an idea of, of where the conservation values line up with the areas we've sort of identified um, with the other two. And then probably the most important one has been are there potential community partnerships that we can tap into because you know, these are all places where lots of people live. Um, they are they're often quite dispersed um, views within the community and we're going to need them on site if we're going to be able to get anywhere. Obviously, once you choose these sites, we start to get specifics about what it is that we need to focus on and what it isn't. You know, like there'd, no be, there'd be no point in us picking Stuart Island and then creating <laughs> out our staffing for those sites. So we haven't done as many trials as we'd like, um, but we are starting to tally them up because our review has given us a whole heap of avenues that we should be trialling or could do with a little bit stronger trialing. Um, we've also been looking at social lures. So um, we've been trialing the good nature rat smell oil, where they basically sort of sucked the smell of a rat off and turned it into a chemical signature and turned it into a little oil based dripping lure. Um, and we've been trialling that. That's been trialled in the Rimatuckers and it's been trialled in the Hawke's Bay. Um, interestingly, in the Hawke's Bay it looked really good and in the Rimatuckers it hasn't looked so good. So we're still working out um, at crunching the numbers and exactly what is going on there. Um, but, um, oh, the other thing I should say is the trialling, it's all against arrays, so the little dried cubes of meat. Um, that is because the scientists in DOC believe that that is our best current long life lure, that or an egg, and we didn't want to carry around a whole of eggs, so we figured we'd carry around some arrays instead. Um, the other social lure that we've been looking at um, and, and, and have put into a trial in the Able Tasman is um, estrus stoat feeding material. Now, we're linked in with the pest control for the 21st century uh, MBIE funded research program based in Lincoln University. Uh, that's now being led by a doc scientist, Elaine Murphy, and she is flat out running all sorts of pen trials with all sorts of different lures and, and testing what's going on. And, 
and one of them, one of the main avenues I've been going down is the pheromone, pheromone path, um, both for rats and for stoats. And she found that in her pen trial, she, with the extra bedding material, they were getting a massive response, both from the males and females. Now, for any scientists in the room, I realise that there's only eight samples there. Um, but in <coughs> our world, that's looking pretty good, so we were happy enough to take that into the field. Um, so we are actually hanging some of that estrus bedding material in the back of these traps inside a little metal tea ball thing. You know that you, you fill with tea leaves and you dunk in your hot water? Yeah, that's got stoke material in the back of um, in the Abel Tasman. And we are only, it's still pretty early days, and we're just, yeah, I mean, at the moment it's holding its own, but there's still plenty of months to go yet. Uh, the other interesting one we look, we've been looking into a bit is sound. So, one of our guys in the electronics team, uh, Stu Coburn, has, was doing a whole heap of work looking into how it is that rats communicate, and he found that about 95% of their communication is through ultrasonics. And there's pretty much two sounds they make. One is kind of a distress sound at a pretty high frequency, and the other is what he's termed um, rat laughter, which is kind of their happy noise, which is at a, which is at a lower <coughs> frequency, it's still in ultrasonics, but it's low enough that we can, that's low enough that we believe studs can hear it. So we took his computer down to Lincoln and put it in front of, uh, or put it in the, beside the cage where a stoat was and played it. And this stoat went pretty crazy, eh? Like it, it came running out of its little hole and slammed up against the wall and tried to find out where the sound was coming from. Um, we thought that was pretty good, but Elaine Murphy was down there, so we thought we'd better do a few controls. So we just had the, the computer there with no sound at all and see if he does anything. And no, he stayed in his little hole and didn't come out. And then we thought, oh, maybe he likes a little bit of sound. So we played some Beethoven. And again, he didn't really do anything to Beethoven. So we thought, oh, yeah, that's looking pretty good. So we are now in the process of working out how we can get that sound into a little device to stick in the back of a box and see if they'll come running. <laughs> um, the other thing we want to check is, which we haven't done yet, but it's in the plan, is to see what the rats do. Because, you know, we don't, we don't really want to repel rats if we can help it. Um, so we're hoping that the rat laughter sound that we're using will either encourage them or at the very least, at least not make them run away. Um, so we're looking to, to give that a crack. Yeah? How did they respond to the rat distress sound? Uh, we didn't go with that because our, um, in looking into what the stoats could hear, it see, the, the evidence we had suggested that they couldn't hear at the frequency that the distress sound was. So we just figured we'd go with the sound that we, we knew was within their range. And then the other one is visual, um, and this came off the back of the, the review actually, which, which someone had done a pen trial and had put mirrors in the back of a box and had watched what the stoats did, and the stoats were really into it. So we decided that's good enough for us, let's see if it would work in the field, because like most of the pen trialling reports we got hold of, it said yeah, this looks promising, it should be tried in the field, and then no one ever did. So we decided we would. So, <coughs> so we created um, some mirrors to basically be the, the back wall of a Doc 200 box, um, single set. And we've yeah, rigged that up as the wall, and that is now, they've now been put, just been put out in Ocarito, where we know there's heaps of stoats, um, yeah, to see, see what happens. So... In that trial, we are, we're actually going for what the additive effect of the mirror is. So both the, the boxes with the mirror and the boxes without the mirror both have arrays in them as well. Um, again, that's because of the, the report used baited boxes both times, so we wanted to, to sort of replicate as much as we could. Uh, the other major project that we're involved in at the moment is the Proof of Free Rakiora project. Now, 
Yeah, um, where to start? <coughs> Gareth Morgan um, came to Doc in about January of 2013 <coughs> uh, following one of his trips down to the sub Antarctics and pretty much asked where we'd got to uh, following the 2008 feasibility report that the community trust did down there. Um, the short answer was we hadn't really got anywhere um, and he being the man he is, said, oh, what, what will it take to get us somewhere? So um, we started with a scoping document looking at you know, what would it take, building on the 2008 report. Um, in that report, we basically concluded that right now it is not feasible to eradicate everything off Stewart Island. Uh, by everything, I don't mean deer. I simply mean rats, possums, and feral cats, and the few hedgehogs that are around the town. Um, from that report, we also concluded that the biggest hurdle at, on Stuart Island right now yeah. is the community, in the sense that we don't have a good handle on what they want. You know, do they want this? What? How do they want it? What does it look like? And so, we proposed a sort of a, a two-phase uh, project. The first phase being this, which is what we're terming the Half Moon Bay project, which is looking to eradicate the predators from, the, from about 4,800 hectares around Half Moon Bay, deline delineated by a predator fence somewhere within that uh, black uh, block. Now the reason for the fence is because right now we don't have the skill to or the technique to uh, stop things from the rest of the island getting into that operational area through the likes of buffers and whatever. Um, and the reason why we bit off the, the town bit first is because we need probably a five to ten year time frame to develop the technologies we need to actually do the big part of the island. And in the meantime, we could work with the community to undertake this project so that they are the ones in the driving seat helping us to decide what's happening, to ideally giving us a hand on the ground and being a part of it so they can see what's involved in this work and, and own the project. Now, we are at the point where we are now working out the detail around how this could work. So, and by this I mean just this project, not the rest of the island. So we're working on three papers, one of which is the fence. So looking at the, the location, the design, the cost, where it could go. Um, mainly because we're quite keen to get this, the cost of fencing down. Right now, printer fences are really expensive. Um, and we're interested in developing a new design that is quick to build, so therefore cheaper. We're also looking at how we can end it. As in, right now, most of our fences end at the high water mark, or they do little spirals, or they do have wings on them. We're interested in knowing whether we can go into the sea. Now, we think if we can go into the sea, we will limit the amount of stuff that goes around it. We realise stuff swims, but we reckon that having something go into the sea is going to be more of a deterrent than having something that stops on the beach. Obviously that's not tested yet and is yet to be done, but it's all part of it. Um, we've also got the other two papers, uh, one of which is the biosecurity stuff, obviously a major, um, and that will be looking at all manner of things like you know, what are the pathways for invasion, what are the options for intervention on there, what would those cost, who would be responsible, what does response look like, all the, all the obvious things. And then the final paper is the, what are the options for how you'd actually get rid of stuff, and what would it look like on the ground, what would be involved um, across all the, the range of techniques. Um, they are limited to techniques that are proven and known to work. Um, we're not looking at this site as a trial for something new. Um, it's our belief that it is really important that if we give this a crack, 
it's at the best possible chance of succeeding because you know, if we're bringing the community along, the last thing we want to do is say, yeah, yeah, we'll do this, and then not actually do it. Um, what I will say is that's a very once over lightly. There is all of the information that we have gathered so far on the project, the scope read reports, the preliminary papers, um, and once we do the big papers, they'll also go on there, are on that website. Um, there's a Q&A on the website to ask questions. All of the questions um, go back to the governance group that has been established. Um, that governance group has 12 members. Um, it covers the full spectrum that you can think of. Uh, we've got, there's DOC, there's local government, both district council and regional council. There are two iwi reps. <coughs> there's Lucky Order Māori Land Trust. There's DOC. There's three community reps. There's a fishing rep. There's probably more that I've forgotten. Um, but yeah, we've got, you know, we're, 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 we're bringing everyone along, hopefully. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage you guys to look at that website to get the information about that. And by all means, ask questions. It's not limited to just you know, the people who live on Stuart Island or live in Southland to ask questions. You know, this, this will be a project of national significance if we get it off the ground. And we're welcoming questions from anyone. That's a good phrase. A project of national significance. <laughs> oh, I, mean, I truly believe it is. I mean, the work has been done by the Morgan Foundation on an economic and social analysis of what Predator Free Stewart Island would bring to the island, to Southland and to New Zealand, and it is highly favourable. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me makes it, you know, and that's just the economics, that's not even the, the ecological significance of pulling something like this off. Um, with Stewart Island being a part of it, um, we've done a little bit of work um, on looking at deer impeller. What I mean by that is We've basically been trying to get our head around what is going on with deer repellent, um, get an understanding of the EPRO well, uh, e product, and then also trying to get an understanding of if you were to develop something else, what's a, how big a deal is that? You know, how, how much is involved? And it's fair to say it's quite big. <laughs> um, there's a whole heap of stuff that's involved in that, and it possible that it would be better to come up with deer management strategies rather than um, deer repellent, or a new deer repellent. Um, but it's early days in that and we're still, you know, it's, it's a moving feast right now. Yes? Is, is, has it been concluded that it is impossible to take the island along and remove the deer? Yeah. So right off the bat, in the scoping document uh, that I me and Al Bramley wrote in 2013, which is on that website. Um, we, we, went, we went down there, we talked to a whole lot of people, we talked to um, all the people through Southland as well, and everyone, basically, without fail, whether they were super green or super any other colour, um, basically said, if you go near there, there's no chance um, at all. And so, we pretty clearly, in big, bold writing, said, right now, deer are not a target. Um, we also said um, that the department still reserves the right to manage deer in the National Park, as is the case now. Um, and in fact, the community group has done deer control in and around that part of the, the island. So it, they don't not control them, but there's no way that right now, if we'd had deer on the, the target, less that this project would go anyway. Is that because of the, uh, the, the the pressure from recreational groups who want their target species preserved? It was from a whole lot. So so yeah, there was recreational hunters that said, yep, you know, this is these these are important to us, particularly the whitetail. Um, but there were others who who have you know declared themselves as very strong environmentalists <coughs> who said the island needs deer on it. And Needs deer. And what they meant by that was the deer bring people to the island. And like there was, there was some conversation we had where, where some people who, who are pretty influential in that community believe that 
that island's on the cusp of not being viable. Like that community's not being not viable. And so they have major concerns about stuff that may limit their sort of economic viability and they see people coming and hunting as a major key part of, of how that island functions. And so it's large, yeah, I mean so it's largely around the hunting thing, but it's not just the hunters who were running it, it was the other rest of the island saying, yeah, we need them to come. I mean we've and we have in the economic analysis that it talks about, you know, that you have this island, you start having you know, ideally in time you'd have things like Kakapo all over the place. You start to get a whole different attraction going on, but that's a long game and, and it, they're not in a long game right now. And so so they kind of, it's kind of needing both. You know, and there's but there's there's other things at play, you know, they've they've got major battles over power and power consistency and power prices. So there's you know talk of hydro schemes, there's there's all manner of things going on there, but yeah, deer's just deer's their deer right now. So reality of that fence though, I presume that over time south of that fence the deer population will increase. Oh, so the people hunt. Sorry, north that, that. So the town park. The town park, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, quite possible. As part of the um, the options of getting rid of stuff, a subset of that work is about you know, what's the consequence on deer in terms of that, so you know, if you build a fence there, what happens and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me having some of the conversations we've had that people would move deer to the other side of the fence. Um, so to keep stocks up or, or run their own little breeding programs. I, I mean, I, you know, like, I, can, I understand where you come from and, and I, if all things were equal, you're probably right, but I don't think all things would be equal in that situation. So, yeah. so you're not including deer. It is no reflection on the feasibility of the movement. It's social and economic factors. Yeah, but those are part of feasibility. If, if the community's not coming yeah. with you, it's not feasible. So, so yeah, so we remove it saying, you put them on the list, this project is gone. <coughs> Yeah, so so when so as part of looking at that stuff, you know, the big scale and da 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 and the community partnership and stuff, there there is of course an aspect of you know what are the community value here, you know, what like if I mean our program originally though was only looking at rat stoke possum, most communities don't value them highly enough to say we want to keep them here. Um, but where it influences it is if there are places where there's something of significance to an aspect of the community, like deer, where we'd have to consider how would you do the elimination part and the monitoring and the response part while keeping that thing of value sustainable. You know, because so, so a lot of our work is, is trying to understand the social dynamic that goes with this. It's going, how does that influence the design process for your solution. You know, at the end of the day, you never get a hundred percent community support. There was always going to be something in the community, but normally very vociferous, uh, opposed to what we might try and do. Yeah. So thank you around that particular issue. You know, how much community support is uh, acceptable or feasible for this group? Yeah, so that that is the exact challenge right now that the governance group on Short Island are grappling with. So they are trying to determine how are they going to make, how are decisions going to be made? You know, how, how do we, yeah, you know, they know 100%, you know, you're not going to get 100%, we already know, we've had people tell us, no matter what you do, I'm not going to support this for whatever reason. And so we don't have an answer, so I don't have an answer for how, you know, is there a magic number? Um, but we're working that through and trying to go, what is, what does that process look like? You know, is there is there a way of, of you know, I don't know, getting the community leaders to be the ones going, we need this, our island dying. You know, like you know, we Jill who owns the, the shop on the island has stood up in front of the community saying, Our island's dying, like you know this, we all know this, no one wants to say it. This is something that could inject some life into it. 
you know, let's at least investigate that kind of stuff. And it's, so it's, you know, is that, you know, how big a part does that play? And it's all of that stuff that was very much working out. And, and it's not been done. Like, it's been tried, you know, Lord Howe Island, for example, <coughs> did a very bad job of it, of basically saying, you, we're going to do this method, and too bad. And that's kind of all blown up. Um, so we've avoided that. And so we're now trying this other approach. <coughs> and I, I can't tell you that it's going to be successful. I have no idea. Um, but right now, it's as good as stab as we've got. So. Good luck on that. Thank you. <laughs> and then, oh, I'm sorry. Um, then the other project we've got going on is, is a, essentially the proof of concept. It's saying if we are going to go with a remove and defend logic, um, can we actually make it work? And so we, for the last uh, year and a bit, we've been working at a place called Putanui Point, which is in the Marlborough Sounds. It's about a 50 hectare peninsula. Um, and We've been looking to defend about 30 hectares on the end, so really small scale, but that's just because it's proof of concept at the moment. Um, and we've only been looking at defending it from uh, rats and possums, and that's because yeah, stoats just move miles, and even just in a night, so there's no way that you'd be keeping them off there, they'd probably bounce there and back before you even realised. So this you're saying is without using a predator-proof fence? Yep, yep, yep I'll explain. Unfortunately, this is going to come up dark again. Can um, you tell me whether Auckland Regional Council Tafaranui is has remained defended? It does have a fence. Tafaranui does have a fence. Regional Park, yes. Yeah. Um, they've had incursions. My understanding is there's mice yeah. in there, and I my understanding initially that was on the target list when they first started, but. Um, my understanding is they've had incursions, but they've responded to them and haven't had population re-establishment, but that is of some time ago, and I'm not completely up to date with it. Mm -hmm. Are there mice in Stuart Island? At the moment, we understand there isn't. There's been no recorded <coughs> evidence of mice. Um, there's schools of thought that are wondering whether having all of the rats, you know, because it's got cure as well, um, and cats there, whether they are at extremely low levels and undetectable, and therefore if we got rid of everything, is, are you suddenly going to see mice? Um, there are others who are saying, nah, that's not the case. People have been looking for years and years and years, haven't found anything. Um, we know that some of the salmon farms have had mice get on them um, from the, you know, the feed and that. Um, so we are working on the basis that there are no mice on that island right now, which means the biosecurity stuff needs to look right down to the level of stopping mice getting there, because if you get everything else off and you then have mice get there, it's like, well, she's all on. So, um, so yeah, so this is looking at defending this, this area without the use of a fence. And now, what we did, obviously, is we removed <coughs> the rats and possums off off everywhere where there's a red line, so from the far right back, um, so that we had a random possum free peninsula to start with. And then we created um, nine sort of lines of defense. Um, so here, so all of them. And then we have four lines, oh, sorry, five lines uh, with monitoring and detection tools on them. Um, the, basically the defence lines are approximately 50 to 100 metres apart um, and the devices on them are extremely high intensity so they are every 10 metres along that line. <laughs> now this is to virtually guarantee encounter but we can't guarantee that they then engage with them. Now, I will say we are not um, envisaging that when this, if you took this to a really large scale, you'd, you'd have devices at every 10 metres. What this is about is proving that it works 
so that we can then strip it back and start to work out where can we get the efficiencies from, what can we automate, what can we spread out, what's giving us range, all that kind of stuff. This is just going, remove and defend, can you even do it at really small scale or are we crazy? Just uh, to, out of interest with that, with those nine lines, with the 10 metre spacing, how much penetration were you getting? I'll get okay, to that yep. in a second. Great. Cool. Um, so just another question. Yep. To the right of your rightmost red line, yes. are you monitoring your concentration of target species on that side? I will get to that also. <laughs> so <laughs> short answer is yes. And I have information for that question. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a general um, strategy going from right to left, um, which is basically sort of repel first, pre-feed and trap, and then pre-feed and toxin. Now, we wanted to have toxins kind of as the last line of defense because we wanted to limit the amount of toxin going into the environment. So we, our thinking was, by having all the other lines in front, we should be limiting the amount of stuff getting through to then start eating the toxin and, and dying out the back. Um, <coughs> the toxin we've been using here is Pindone for rats and collie for possums. Now that's because this is in the sounds. There's loads of weka and dock in the sounds aren't keen on ferrotox um, with weka because um, it kills them. So in the line, I'll just give, I'll just give you an idea of what we've what we've had and what we've been going on. Um, the front furthest right line, we actually put Weka there. So Weka get caught, live caught on Maud Island, and this is one of the places they get put, because um, they don't want to be on Maud, obviously there's lots of sensitive stuff that the Weka would nail, so they live capture them and then release them elsewhere. This is one of the places, and we set up feeding stations for them along that front line based on some evidence anecdotal evidence that we received from a few people saying that where, pos uh, sorry, where weka numbers are high, rat numbers are low. They also told us that where weka numbers are high and there's lots of food, they drop their territoriality and they're quite happy to live together. And so they don't go nailing each other. So we thought, you know what, that's good enough for us, let's give that a crack. Basically also because we had very little in the rappel toolbox. No, very little at all. So we went with our weka. Um, it's fair to say that we have absolutely no idea how effective they were. Um, it's also come to light following some work by the weka recovery group using um, some transmitters that record activity that come about 3.30, 4 o'clock, Weka pretty much stop moving around and stop doing their hunting and kind of park up and then don't get up until the morning. And obviously rats pretty much do the opposite. So we don't really know whether they see much of each other at all. Um, but it was worth a crack. So we, the next lines had a line of A24s. Um, these were used largely for the fact that they can reset and go again. Um, we then tried another line of a rappel, which was a light line. Um, this was solar powered, so that it, and then it was done by PR sensors, which when it anything got within two meters, a hell of a lot of LEDs just lit up in its face. Um, again, in the hope that these are nocturnal animals, they don't really like light and they'd run away from them. What I will say is, Repelling is good enough for us because all we're looking is to defend is this bit here. Right now, we don't really mind if the thing turns around and runs back into the rest of the sounds as long as it doesn't come through our defence. Um, we then had some A12s for possums. Uh, we then had some Doc 200s. Now, these were in two lines. What the first line was set permanently open and baited so that the idea being that the rats would come in, have a feed, 
be quite comfortable coming into a box um, for two reasons. One being that we would then hope that they would run back and as relatively social animals tell their buddies that there's free food in these boxes. Um, and also next time they came to a box would be more inclined to run into it and that would be the box that squashes the head. Um, we used both, we had some boxes with peanut butter and some boxes with the rat oil um, smell stuff. Uh, we also had trapinators <coughs> for possums. Uh, we modified the set off weight for the trapinators halfway through the, the program because we were concluding that they were having to work too hard. They were actually having to pull too much to um, set them off. So we lightened that and they suddenly became an extremely effective tool for controlling possums. Um, and then we had collie pre-fed and then toxic and we had pindo in those last lines. Uh, we used tracking tunnels, chew cards <coughs> and wax tags every 50 metres along those P lines which were about 100 metres apart. Um, another thing of note that um, is that we found <coughs> chew cards to be far more sensitive than wax tags as a monitoring tool which basically backed up some work that Landcare had already done um, looking at something very similar. So what did we learn? Um, we worked out that we think we're screening about 80% of the possums and about 90% of the rats with our system. Uh, we had monitoring at the front, not all the time, but um, periodically, I think it was every three, two to three months, just to check what was going on out the front. Um, and we were getting uh, BMIs of anywhere from 30 to 90% for possums and about 20 to 30% tracking for rats. <coughs> uh, we had, we've had no population establishment out the back. We, our detection out the back has been sensitive enough for us to be able to hunt down individuals and kill them. Um, on the odd occasion, we have had to bring in a couple of leg holds out the back to get the possum that has made it through. Um, interestingly enough, we have also caught We've had about nine rats caught out the back, six of which were healthy enough to get, oh sorry, not healthy enough, uh, they were in good enough state when we got to them that we could test them for toxic residue to see whether they were walking dead or not. Um, three of which would have been, um, they had high enough doses in them that would have killed them. The other three, um, the lab couldn't, conclusively say, yep, that's Walking Dead. It said, yep, it had toxin in it, but it couldn't say whether it was enough to knock it over. The question, yep. did you do that during masks? If not, what would you have expected if the masks had occurred? Uh, we, I would have probably expected a lot more pressure in a mask. That, this wasn't during the mask. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I'd expect more pressure on the system. I don't know how the system would react. Um, but I'll kind of get to that in a second as well. Um, because for us, this was showing enough promise. So we thought, let's see if we can go a bit bigger. Um, which we've chosen another site which is about a tenfold increase, which Excuse is. Phil, Phil, just sorry, just back to the big one. <coughs> how did you stop. Uh, animals getting through along the coastline? Uh, we didn't. Okay. Um, we, we had no, um, no, barrier. no barrier, no coast. Like, it end, the, the last device on each side ends where the high tide would get to. So we had a couple actually washed away because we misjudged the high tide. Um, but we had stuff right <coughs> to the shore. But yeah, at low tide, stuff could have walked around. Um, so we, again, at this sort of scale and this, we weren't so worried about, I mean, obviously if we had been flooded and it had gone really badly, then we probably would have been like, well, you know, what's, how bad is it, sort of thing. Um, but 
given what we were getting happening and, and the fact that very little was actually getting thrown out the back, we didn't really worry so much about it. Um, it is something we have to consider, like when we go into this next big, the bigger one, we are sort of factor, thinking about how, you know, how big a deal is that, and we don't really know yet, so we're sort of um and an ahhing about should we do it, is, there, is it important enough yet to do anything, or should we just set the system up in a similar way and see first, see what happens. Um, we're kind of, yeah, not really sure yet which way to go. What was your budget for the small one? Ah. Uh, it was expensive, relatively speaking, um, because of how intense the devices were and the fact that we had someone there all the time checking them. To be honest, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember. Um, right now, it is nowhere near as cheap as whacking a fence up or something like that. Um, but again, we weren't so much worried about the, the cost against other methods yet because we just wanted to see if the method would work before then going to look at efficiencies and making it cheaper. We know what you know, control costs, we know what 1080 drops costs, we know what fences cost, so we know what those are that we kind of need to get within the ballpark of. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't worry that it was getting expensive relative to that yet, if that makes sense. But I can't remember what it is. I can, Give me my card and you can email me and I can find out for you if you want, if it's important, like if it's critical. Um, so you said you haven't actually got a site yet that you're working on and this is a trial. Are you going to actually maintain it now that you've got... Um, I'm about to, we're about to go... So the short answer is that site, no. <laughs> we're going to shut that site down. So that'll just come back in. Yep, but that site has no... Eco well, it has ecological value. It has no significant ecological value in how people would perceive it. You know, it's, we chose a site that was of low econo ecological value because if it had failed straight away, we didn't want to be like, <coughs> crap, we've stuffed something. So, so that's why it's so small, that's why it's not really in a, you know, that's why Doc puts the wick in there. Because it's like, we don't want them on an island that's got frogs and lizards and stuff that they would go for. Let's stick them here where they can eat whatever they like. So, um, where, where we're going next, so this place, Bottle Rock Peninsula, does have ecological value, it, in, in the sense that Doc ranks it, it's within the top 400, it's, or it's part of, uh, the, the big block is part of is the top 400, we're just picking off a, a bit of it. Um, Sorry, where is Bottle Rock? I was just going to say, <laughs> so, <laughs> across here, is oh. part of the Queen Charlotte track. Oh, oh yeah. Ship Cove is there. Um, yeah, that's Long Island, if yeah. you know the sounds. Um, yeah, to the Marble Sound, Queen Charlotte Sound. Um, this is, this will be, this, this block, the, the bit from the Queen Charlotte track to the rest of it, is about 440 hectares. So again, it's not going massive, we're just, building our scale as we learn how we're doing it. Um, and we'll, it'll be about 350 that we'll be protecting once we've put our zone of defense in. Um, we've stripped it back, we've got about seven lines now. We're also, rather than having one tool per line, there's a little bit more of a blend <coughs> happening. We're still debating the exact blend because we haven't started yet. We have laid it down. Um, yeah, our thinking at the moment is again we'll lay it pretty intensively. We'll um, run it for a bit, see what works, and then start to to look at um, yeah the efficiencies. One of one area we're looking at is to can we automate some of the traps so they tell us what's going on rather than us having to see them all the time. Um, uh, and that being um, leg hold traps, um, because they are by far the most effective possum control tool we have right now. <coughs> um, but that's, there's a wee way to go yet, and it's early days and how that would work and all that kind of stuff. But 
we are already starting to think uh, of, of how do we actually get this to be efficient because yeah, yeah, there's a, an awful lot of distance even at that scale when you start thinking about the lines and how many times you'd be, how many devices you'd be looking at and that kind of thing. So we're hoping to get this underway this financial year. Um, the ideal is that we wanted it up and running for the mast um, because there's a, a reasonable amount of beach in the, the back. So sort of, this is Mount Fermo for people who know it. Um, so there's a reasonable amount of, of red beach in here. So there's not so much in here, but this would generate probably quite a nice little swarm. Um, but yeah, it, we don't know if we're going to get it up and running in time. Um, we also don't know how big the mast is going to be yet, but um, that's what we're up to, we're trying to get up to. Um, as part of this, there's a few things we're continuing to look at. So we're continuing to look at lures. Um, how do we make them last a long time? Um, how do we do, you know, can we maintain the effectiveness? Can we get them more effective? Um, these sorts of things become more and more critical the bigger you take the scale because the less you have to go to your devices, the better, um, as long as they're still effective and doing their job. Um, we want to, to start a little bit of work about understanding what we term lonely rat behaviour. So what, what does that rat or what does that possum do when it busts our line and gets out the back? Where does it go? What, are, you know, what, what does it follow a similar pattern? We know there's been some work done on islands. Um, the biggest probably has been the work done on Olva. Um, we want to know, like, can you, does the same thing where it bounces all over the island for a while before settling back down in an area, does that happen at really big scale? Or how far does that thing go before it starts to bounce back the other way? Because if you can start to understand that pattern, you can start to design your detection for that pattern rather than just having detection tools everywhere. Um, that kind of logic becomes really important when you start thinking about detecting a single rat that gets back to Stewart Island at 170,000 hectares. You know, you're not going to have tracking tunnels at every 50 metres over that island. Um, also, they, moving on from that, we also want to improve our detection tools, make our detection tools smarter and actually get them to start working for us so that, again, can we automate them so that they're telling us what's going on without us having to go there and can we get that sort of stuff in real time? Um, you know, what sort of information do we need to absolutely to make the decision? You know, can we strip out the amount of information we need so that we can actually get cell phones sending us signals because the more information you get sent back, the harder it is, it's much more expensive, it takes a lot longer, it cranks through the power, basically. And that's it. Areas of our work program. Oh, no, there's one more thing. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the um, deterrent toolbox is virtually empty. Um, so we're keen on looking into that. Can we create something that will could be our very first line in that um, in that system to to deter things and we've ditched the lights, we've ditched the the wicker for our, we had no deterrent line yet planned for the bottom rock site, um, but we are contemplating yeah trying to find something. Um, right now we're wondering whether that's ultrasonic sound, um, which we know at certain frequencies can well it can make humans feel sick. So I imagine. It, can do all sorts of things to other animals, but obviously we need to be careful with what we're doing because it's it's going to be out track and people are going to be walking along. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's my work program. <laughs> of course, with the repellent, um, once a, an animal gets through, then it won't get back. Potentially, yeah, it depends. <laughs> it depends if you can if you can um, create it to repel one way. <coughs> so like a, so, you repel them out, but a, but they can still run back pass through, kind of like a two-way mirror, potentially. We don't know. I mean, it's, it, there's nothing in the two, we don't, you know, it's, we're starting from zero, so we're kind of, yeah, interested in all sorts of crazy ideas, because we'll try them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> for monitoring two cats versus tracking tunnels, are they specific? Will a possum go through a tracking tunnel? Now, nah, so the two card oh, right. is for the possum, but rats obviously go for them as well. Um, but no, the, the only thing that you'll know about a possum is that it'll, it'll tear up your tracking tunnel and or stand on and squash it. I mean, you can occasionally see a little hand that's, well, not little compared to the rest of the hands that are in there, that's kind of like reached in and try to grab the peanut butter and stuff. But as a reliable tool, you wouldn't have them as your tool for detecting possums. You'd use two cards or wax tags, but two cards were more sensitive. There was, there was a student using much bigger tracking tunnels with specific purpose for possums, but they are huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was interesting what you were saying about the rat bouncing all around because potentially they could go through lots of trekking tunnels and make it look like you've got a massive infestation where there's only one animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want, so, so that little cartoon of the, the rat detection thing to go to the dude on the sun lounger, um, part of that thinking is if you're going to get smart with your detection tools and automate them and things, one of the critical bits would be time stamping. So you can start to see when things are going off so that, because if you're getting something over here and over here within virtually the same time, you know that's more than likely two different animals. But if you're getting a sort of a, a pattern of slow movement throughout, you can start to make some assumptions that it's possibly more likely to be one. So if you nail one, then you wait around to see what else is happening. So, so yeah, you're right. You need right now. We can't. There's loads of things we can't do without detection. That's one of them. We can't tell that that's one rat or five. 25 or whatever. So, so that's something we'd like to, to look into and see if we can solve. At one stage, Lanky was playing around with testing hair particle samples so that basically whichever animal ran through something, they got you know, hair stuck to a, a sticky bus or some sort of thing. They, they got DNA tested to see how many individuals were running around. Yeah, so that, that works for a specific purpose for that works for knowing how many individuals you've got, but it relies on you going to that thing. Mm -hmm. To get that, to automate that information would crank way too much power to do the processing and all that. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is go, what is the very small, what is the bare minimum information I need? Basically, I just need to know that it's rat, or it's possum, depending on what, or stone, whatever thing you're trying to detect, um, in the easiest way. So. To, uh, to my mind, that overcomplicates it, but for the purpose of what they would have been doing, no doubt it would have been, uh, it would have told them exactly the information they want, but they would have been knowing they're going to that thing. I'd rather like to not have to go to mine if I can help. <laughs> what, about, what about visual scales to try and figure out? Because um, in terms of, you know, the weight will give you some idea as to the possible rat. Yep, yep, we're, we're, we've wondered about weight. Um, we've also wondered about the power of their pulp um, when they bite something. So we are looking at, is there a way of, is there, a, is there enough distinction between the two to be able to say, yep rat, yep possum, and not have too much grey? Because we need to know what it is, because we'd likely be taking the response tool to that place, so we'd want to know whether we're taking a rat Thing or a possum thing. Um, so yeah, we are looking at, at that and trying to work it. Is there, is there difference and stuff? And we've only just sort of kind of cottoned on to that and now we're trying to play around and see if it works. We'll see if we can find a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Have you got a website for bright ideas? No, but I have um, an email address and I work at Doc and I'm more than happy for people to send me stuff. We don't have, I mean, we have the doc website, I mean, there's, yeah. like, we're just, we're a it's work program with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just that people who are in electronics do all sorts of funny things, working in something entirely different when yep. you talk, suddenly come up. Yeah, yeah, and we're quite keen to, to basically tap up some of those people as well, you know, like, I think it was the Angus's crowd I was talking about, um, when I was talking about the Lures, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of keen on talking to like the likes of Glade who make those little things that like stick in cars or stick on your toilet that last for bloody ages but they stink all the time mm -hmm. and whether there's something in that technology that we can leverage off to stick on the side of our boxes or whatever you know and it's that kind of stuff yeah. where 
we haven't gone before. Like we haven't thought about other industries that are doing stuff that you know, we could either nick or borrow or buy or whatever, you know. And, and it's that kind of stuff that, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, you, yeah, we have all sorts of crazy ideas and we welcome the crazy ideas. So, And because and in, in every idea, there is something we can build off. You know, there's something there that when we strip it down and go, what's the core thing that that's answering that we can hook into? You know, so yeah. So, but no, I mean, because we're in Doc and we're just a, you know, we're just another team in, amongst it all, we don't have our own website or anything like that set up. But just use the Doc one would be my first thing and put my name on it. <laughs> yeah, someone else should be the pointer because I see, I only see the hands that go up right in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. So that comes back to to the core of our thinking, which is once we know where we're going at, in terms of the really big scale sites, then you start to to uh, to get those constraints, and you start to go, well, how could you do that? You know, say we bit off Wellington City. It's like what, what could we run down State Highway 1 that cuts that off and, and we demo, you know, all the way around to Potidur and South kind of stuff and then, and you start going, what, can I use that? Can I use the highway? Can I, you know, and, but we haven't, we haven't gone there because we don't know where we're to, we don't quite have the end site yet. So at the moment we're still playing with the Proof of, essentially proof of concept, it, it does the logic stack up. You know, in, in reality, does this work? Can we make it work? And then, because right now, that stuff's not revolutionary. There's not stuff there that you couldn't, you couldn't use anywhere, really, yet. Um, it'll just be those specifics of going, okay, what are we modifying, or what, or what can't we use, you know, and stuff like that. But we don't know yet, but you're right, there will be specific stuff that will come up at the site we need. Yeah, I guess it, I mean, I mean my, my first thought immediately is what's the goal of the project? So what is it that, because I don't pretend to stand up here and say remove and defend is the only way forward and that's the future of New Zealand conservation. There will be situations where it's perfectly, perfectly suited and it makes sense and it's the way we want to go. And then there's other methods that, you know, like Aero 1080 does a, awesome job of doing huge landscapes and we're not pretending to say now nah, let's scrap that and let's just remove and defend the whole New Zealand away so there may, it may well be that you don't need a predator rat free bit right now for whatever the goals are so it may well be that it's just the network either is doing the job you need for right now or it needs some tweak depending on what your goal is so I'd, I'd, I'm reluctant to say whack a boundary around it and and get it done that way without knowing what you're trying to do outcome wise. Can I just uh, say something about this? Some of us are trying to get a the land here halo project off the ground, basically to create a buffer zone around the main job. So you know, we rely uh, almost completely on community and community involvement. So we will done on a we'll be done on a proper scientific basis. Um, as you know, all animals have ranges, so if you get enough dots around Karoo, then you have to do a reasonable degree of control when you're doing eradication. And then once you do that, then you start stepping out. So that's the way I'll get things for the community to pick up, rather than the control agencies like uh, DOC or City Council or Regional Council. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. like I, I think Halo's awesome. I mean, 
the fact that those that that community is hooking in to give the spillover essentially somewhere that's a hell of a lot safer than what it could be is awesome. I think it's even better that it's not reliant on an agency to pick it up. I mean, if we if we find there is a community that wants to to wants to hook in and do this, I'm not pretending that we we need to be the ones to do the work. I'm more than happy to have anyone do the work. It's as so it as long as long as it gets done, and as long as we're achieving what we're after. I mean, I think that's the often often it is. I'm going through quite a bit of paperwork right now. I imagine it's probably easier in a lot of ways for others to do. <laughs> Is there a priority or hierarchy in terms of those predators? Like, you know, if you just go for the stoats, then your rats are going to get away on you. It's sort of other, other stoats better there, keeping the rats under control, perhaps. Do you? I. A hard one. I am not convinced that there is a hierarchy or that there needs to be a hierarchy. Um, I mean, but that's because I view these sites as, but the big sites, I mean, as rat, possum, stoat. Like, all of them, maybe not necessarily all at the same time, but all of them gone. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm probably not the best person qualified, but there's, there's probably plenty of scientists who would have their view on what's most important. I imagine rats have got to be pretty high on the, the list of, of the, the major um, you know, uh, agents of ecological harm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we've basically gone rat, stoat, possum, or rat, possum, stoat, or stoat, whatever <laughs> order you want to put it in, because universally they are you know, pretty much agreed as the, the big bad three to start with and then sort of sort out the rest. But then, I mean, then we've had others, of, you know, we've had people remind us about, well, what, what's going to happen to mice, all that kind of stuff, and it's going, well, someone needs to have a crack at the problem and we're having a crack this way. I mean, it may well fail, but, <coughs> I'm, you know, I'm keen to have a crack at it. And I, but I don't, I don't know if there's a... I don't have a personal number one enemy. I think, I think basically, along the principles of the framework, that's the, you know, you, you take one thing out and two patients will happen to the other three or four will have them very much put in there. So, um, and, and I think it also depends very much on what your target is. I mean, in, in Wanganui we're doing large scale aerial genetic control with the sole purpose of protecting the forest canopy. So the target was possum. Um, Stoats and, and rats were a lucky by kill. Um, but you know, that, that was the minimum level that we were willing to accept. Um, so it very much depends on your target. If, if it's birds, you, you will need to do more about stoats and, uh, stoats and, and rats as well. Okay. Question down the back. Yeah, so um, for a number of years, I don't know how many, um, as part of various, well, what's now NBIE, it used to be Morst and Forst and whatever other name it's at, um, invested about 20 million over a number of years. My understanding is they got to the point where they could make possums infertile, but they had absolutely no way of transferring it. So they basically had to catch the possum and then inject it with the thing. Oh, so if you had to catch a possum and inject it with something, um, because it, it's not transmitting it through the population, you might as well just kill it. So um, it eventually sort of stopped there. Um, they, they concluded they couldn't really work out how to take it further. Um, it was a nematode that was succeeding in life that was genetically modified. Oh, okay. They discovered that there was so much Anti, like anti-sentiment to GMO, if that stopped it. Oh, okay, right. And basically, with the disruption, it was pretty lengthy. Right, okay. Of course, possums are protected in spray, so... Exactly. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. 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 In, in terms of the, the hierarchy of threat, um, we've been 
tracking now for a year just north of Paikokariki and a close colleague of ours on Queen Elizabeth Park across the State Highway 1, consistently catching weasels at a ratio of about five or about five to stoats. Now they never seem to get a mention and yet um, the prey certainly includes invertebrates and birds. Uh, weasels are as likely a threat to invertebrates and birds, so wetters and, and birds. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they never seem to be a recognised target in terms of predator species and yet, as I say, we're catching them at a rate of about five to every one stoat. Uh, any reason why not? Uh, partly I think it's people say stoat and probably mean any mustard that gets caught. Um, also I think in most, um, hab in most ecosystems in which we're predominantly working, it predominantly is stoats that are the problem. Um, although interestingly, Mount Taranaki actually have a, a reasonable issue with um, weasels I've subsequently learned um, following 1080 drops. They, they, they wonder about a, some sort of release. Um, yeah, but that would be my guess, is that in the, and this is just from a doc, is, it, um, is that yeah, most of the environments we work in, it would be, um, it would be stoats. Um, so I <coughs> may wonder maybe is it a, a specific habitat type thing in this case, but I, I, I don't know. But <coughs> okay, right. Yeah. At Otari, in the forest, we'll catch stoats, but on the edges where it's, where it's um, farmed areas, that's where we catch the weasels. Yeah, right. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. Question. How, how effective are the, the traps in reducing the population? So if you took somewhere like, say, Rumtaka Forest Park, and you put the traps in there, which are, are not that dense, um, is there still some sort of reading about to what extent it's, it's actually reduced the population of there's probably people in here who probably are qualified to answer that and probably work for the, or are part of the trust, I would think. Well, I'm just thinking, even say with other areas, I mean, remember seeing some statistics just recently down in, in Fiordland, in, in somewhere we were staying, at which sort of indicated the tracks were actually really effective. They, um, I can't remember the percentages, but they were really significant. Yeah, I'm, oh, yeah again, I'm not, this isn't saying that those things, I mean, those traps in there are part of what we're working on. Um, again, it's about the the outcome you're after, and, and in a lot of cases, yeah, traps are really effective. And the bonus of traps is they they are there permanently as a suppression. Whereas things like aerial 1080, we do it cyclically, so you have the sort of uh, peaks and troughs, I suppose, of of predator abundance before you knock them back, and, and that kind of thing. Whereas with with trapping, you usually you would get less of a, a the, the big rise and fall. Um, so yeah, I mean they are very effective. It's about I would just implore that you think what is the outcome I want, and then work back from that to say what then is the best method for that outcome, knowing what I know about the site, the people, the how much I can serve, you know, what can I serve as, or what can the group serve as. And all of that to decide whether which method is the best method. But I would, yeah, it's got to be what's your outcome first, and then think about how to get there. Put it another way: would traps be a good mechanism for sort of eliminating rats from a specific area if, if that was the actual goal? So they can be. They can be. They can be. Yeah, I think actually because I have the answer. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. They can be, but again, it would, it's, there's a whole raft of stuff around where it is what's going on around it, you know, how much flooding into the site are you getting from, you know, from elsewhere. So there's a whole lot that would go into it, but yeah, you could, you can do a whole heap of stuff. Can I answer the rim and tucker? Yes, you can. Sure. The traps are very effective, as you can see, but the aim is protection of the kiwi, the released kiwi, which are actually breeding there. Um, so it's the surrounding of the kiwi area and the big hills. The traps are very effective because there is no possum control in the Aroma Roma Valley, thanks to land care, still, I believe. Um, 
which I try to do something about. Um, well, I believe you have outlived a free possum because if you walk along, if you want to see the effect of possum traps and you walk along Cattle Ridge at certain times of year, they have these ones that hang on trees. And one time we saw five possums, beautiful with their tails, hanging on the Cattle Ridge, which is the boundary of the land care don't kill anything, and don't kill a possum, or don't be seen killing a possum, and the uh, Rimataka Trust area. But they are specifically for the Kiwis, so they are very, very effective. It's just bad power with traps. Oh, bad power. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we get that there's, there's an element of effort that will go into it, and that's, again, that's about mapping how you want to do stuff, and there, are, and, there, and there are animals that get trip trip shy, so you know, there's a proportion you're not going to give. There's a question just in the back here. I just wanted to go back to the word predator. Um, is, is it specifically targeted at the conventional definition of the word predator, you know, animal, animals that prey on other animals, or are we talking a slightly wider kind of definition of animals that affect the ecology, like rabbits? So in, in the context that I use it for, for this work program, I'm specifically meaning rat, stoat, possum, and, and in some cases feral cats. So Stewart Island feral cats are part of the predator suite we're after. Um, so that's, that's what the predators I mean when I'm talking about it. How other people use the word is anyone's guess. You've kind of got to ask them what they mean. <laughs> and the same can we see for pest. We have to, sorry, we have to wrap up there. Time, time is up, I think. It's, yes, time is up. Sorry. <laughs> Going to have to um, uh, yeah, call, call the questions to an end there. Thank you very much, Phil, for um, coming along and speaking. Sure.